Now the way you've lived your life is good and true. You were taught the right way, and you did choose. You've always known that God was there, right by your side. You were never alone, living out on your own. And we wish that all of life's pains and sorrow we could have taken away from you. Oh God, please help us to make it through. And we will pray for you.
I'd like to say thank you to the participants so far. Claudette Colvin has impacted many, and Victoria Wilson is one of those young people touched by her story. Victoria has dedicated and determined herself to get Claudette Colvin's message and her story out there. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome Victoria Wilson and her staff with her artist for a letter to Claudette Colvin. It is such an honor to be here. If I can help somebody as I travel along, if I can cheer somebody with the word of song, if I can show somebody that he might be traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Today is just not one day of celebrating what Miss Colvin did. It's a celebration with all my being, all of my love, and knowing that there is a God in heaven that shine down, shines down on us and gives us the tools and the strength and the courage to do what is right. And she did that 63 years ago. It would not be without me, but with my wonderful cast, I would like them to stand, please. Sharon, Jeanette, Zaria, Roy, Garrett, Brady, and Allen. And also the parents of Azaria Carter that plays the role of young Claudette Colvin. Mr. and Mrs. Carter, please stand as well. Thank you. Many of people ask me, why are you doing this? What about Ms. Ro Mrs. Rosa Parks? I'm doing this because of this message only. When during African American history and all the courses that I studied, I didn't hear about Ms. Colvin. I heard about her one time during a theatrical production that I was a part of. And the director informed me that, oh, she's not important. And I knew deep down inside that there must be a reason why you're mentioning her name in our history. So I studied. I researched, I made phone calls, I bothered people simultaneously all over the times over and over again to make sure that I knew about her story. And today I'm so glad that God gave me the vision way back on last year. I ran from this goal and this vision a year before that time and I knew this was the time. My platform is to make sure that our young people are encouraged and are involved with our community, with health, health care, education, economic development, all those things, it's important for them to be leaders today and to learn that you're not too young for our elderly people, you're not too old to take a true stand for justice. And she was right, it was her constitutional rights, and it's our right today to do what we can to improve our society by helping our young people with our church, with our community, and Lord knows with our schools. I love Ms. Colvin, I never met her, but I feel like I've known her all my life, and I would do everything in my power to share her story with the nation. So I do present to you all a short film presentation entitled, A Letter to Claudette Colvin. Thank you for having me. Give me the 
streets to climb. And Lord, don't take away In here, nigga. Why don't you get up and let this nice lady have this seat? I'm sitting in my right section. I am not moving. I'm gonna ask you one more time. Move! And I'm gonna tell you one more time. I'm not moving. I paid my fare. I'm sitting in my right section. This is my constitutional right. Constitutional right? Okay.
Y'all better make it light on yourself and give them those seats. Are you going to move? No. No? I said no. If you don't give me those seats, I'm going to have you arrested. You may do that, stupid nigga. Give me the police. We got this nigga on this bus. She needs to get off. Come now. So what's the problem? She's sitting in the colored section. Not anymore. Lady, will you just move? Why do you keep pushing us around? Listen at this nigga. She gonna sit there and cult back? Well, the law is the law. I'm gonna have to place you under arrest. Come with me, please. Dear Claudette, my beautiful and courageous black sister. Lord knows I don't know how you did it at 15 years old. But God, it was your grace and mercy. For years, we marched, we protested. But you, you wanted your freedom now. You said that it felt like history was pushing you down. So Jonah on your right, and Harriet Tubman on your left. I have Claudette Coven. I'm able to sit down where I am today because of you. Thank you for your sacrifice. We love you, Rose.
Good afternoon, everyone. Can I get your attention, please? Well, as you know, we just got Rosa out of jail. And we've also been having some serious conversations about this Montgomery boycott movement. And my feeling is, well, I, I actually want to ask Rosa to become the face of this boy. What about Claudette Colvin? Claudette Colvin? Yes. Nah, I don't think that's a good idea. Why not? She's a troublemaker. She then went out and got herself pregnant. She's dark-skinned. Okay, enough. As you know, we support all our brothers and sisters here. And the most important thing here is this boycott to us. But the main thing is, Rosa understands what's going on here. She works for the NAACP. I, I think that gives us a more solid footing for us moving forward. So I truly want to ask her if she would give us the honor of becoming the face of this movement for us. <laughs> And speaking of which, welcome home. Brother Nixon, how you doing? Oh, it's fine, welcome home. It's been a long road. We were actually just uh, speaking about you. We've decided we are going to move forward with this movement. And I wanted to ask you personally, would you give us the honor of being the face of this movement? Glory, hallelujah. It's time, Brother Nixon. We've come a long ways, but it's time for us to work together. Now, Claudette, she is a wise, courageous girl. But if you ask me to do it, I'd do it for my people. I was hoping you would say that. Thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Everybody, we're on our way. Have a great evening, children. Okay, everybody, back to work. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you.
can we give Victoria and her cast another hand for a letter to Claudette Colvin? Thank you, Victoria. We will now hear an introduction of our guest speaker by Councilman Tracy Larkins, followed by wise words from Attorney Fred Gray. Good morning. I am so deeply touched by this presentation. Ms. Wilson, for you and your staff, you did yeoman's work. Let's show them how Montgomery appreciates them. Thank you so much. This is always a special kind of occasion for me, event for me, as a native of King Hill, and one who lived just yards away from where Claudette Colvin grew up, and to now represent the King Hill community on the Montgomery City Council is the greatest honor that has ever been bestowed upon me. And today I have the enviable or unenviable task of presenting our guest contributor. A few years ago as a teacher, or at least attempting to be a teacher of English, at the Calhoun School in Lowndes County, Alabama, I posted on my classroom wall these words from the celebrated past president of Morehouse College, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. It is not your environment. It is you. The quality of your mind, the integrity of your soul, and the determination of your will that will decide your future and shape your life. It is not your environment. It is you. The life and the work of our guest contributor today is emblematic of the truth and the veracity of that quote. Born in Montgomery, Alabama, on what many would characterize as the wrong side of the tracks, he has become a legend in the annals of American history and certainly American jurisprudence. Not very long ago, the city of Montgomery honored him with the placement of a historical marker on historic Dexter Avenue, bearing his name and his history, at a site where he once owned an office building, which at that time housed his law firm. On that occasion, I was granted the high honor of saying a few words about him. In my presentation, I referred to him as an eagle man, a man of God, who was not afraid to stand in the face of adversity and who was willing to fight the good fight, no matter how uncomfortable or how challenging. Why did I call him an eagle man? Well, largely because of the specialness of his nature. The eagle is no ordinary bird the mighty eagle, the mighty eagle with its regal presence, its reputation as the king of birds, its propensity for dwelling in high and lofty places, and its freedom, its strength, its speed as epitomized by its majestic flight. So the mighty eagle is a fitting symbol for greatness. And just as with the eagle, our speaker today is the fitting symbol of greatness. First and foremost, he's a lawyer. But he's also a preacher. 
civil rights activist, former state representative, husband, father, humanitarian. After graduation from Alabama State College in 1951, he was encouraged to apply for law school by one of his teachers. And because he was forbidden to attend law school in his native state of Alabama because of his race, he moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where he received the Juris Doctor degree from Case Western Reserve University School of Law in 1954. Upon passing the bar, he made a vow. He vowed to return to his home state and do everything that he could do within his power to end racial segregation. A cursory glance, just a cursory glance at his resume affirms his phenomenal success in accomplishing that goal, eradicating racial segregation in the state of Alabama. In some of his first cases as a young attorney, he defended Claudette Colvin. He defended Rosa Parks, both of whom were arrested and charged with disorderly conduct for refusing to give up their seats on the segregated Montgomery bus system. He also achieved prominence with work with Martin Luther King and E.D. Nixon. He represented the Montgomery Improvement Association, the organization that was started to run the bus boycott during the more than year-long bus boycott of 1955, which led ultimately, as you have already heard, to the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the famous Browder versus Gale case. It was that Supreme Court ruling that ended lawful segregation on Montgomery City buses. He has subsequently taken the lead on a myriad of significant litigation too numerous to mention. Dixon v. Alabama, Gomillion v. Lightfoot, Lee v. Macon County Board of Education. He successfully represented Vivian Malone and James Hood, who were denied admission to the University of Alabama. He also sued Florence State College, now known as the University of North Alabama, on behalf of Wendell Wilkie Gunn, an African-American who had also been denied admission to a state college based on his race. Mr. Gunn went on to serve in the Reagan administration and eventually founded his own consulting business, a software company known as Gunn Solutions. And we are privileged and honored to have Mr. Gunn with us in the audience today. In 1970, our guest contributor, along with the late Thomas Reed, became the first African Americans elected to the Alabama legislature since Reconstruction. In 1972, he represented plaintiffs in a class action lawsuit concerning the infamous Tuskegee Syphilis Study, in which the federal government allowed this dread disease, syphilis, to go untreated in 399 African Americans in order to study its debilitating effects on the human body. In 1975, this lawyer won a settlement of $10 million and medical treatment for life for the 72 survivors of that experiment. His autobiography, Bus Ride to Justice, was published in 1994, and a revised edition of that book published in the year 2012. So yes, the eagle is properly recognized as the king of birds. Our special guest contributor today is without doubt an indisputable king among men. The sum total of his life, the sum total of this life, a life well lived, now totaling some 87 years, is best exemplified in the immortal words of the British poet, Alfred Lord Tennyson, taken from the epic poem, Ulysses. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength, 
which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to give you the Honorable Fred David Gray. Good afternoon. I had to see whether it was morning or afternoon. What do you say when you had an introduction like that? If I were wise, I probably would say thank you very much, Councilman Lockin, and take my seat. But if I would, some of you would be disappointed. But let me say to Councilman Larkin, who I have known since Claudette Carvin's uh, arrest, and that was a long time ago, had the opportunity of watching him grow and watching him develop and he has certainly developed into an outstanding person, a great councilman, and a person that this city should feel proud of, and the moving force behind having his friend and his neighbor uh, properly acknowledged and having it so that not only this event celebrates a commemoration for Claudette, but other events also. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Tamir Todd Strand, it's always good to see you. It's always good to be home. We were in class, Alabama, together a long time ago. And I used to ride around. He used to drive me around to those various meetings across the state. I've seen him grow from the business field into uh, the great mayor of this city. We're appreciative for his leadership and appreciative for what he does on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Not only are we appreciative to him, but we appreciate it to all of the city officials of the city of Montgomery for what you have done and what you are doing toward preserving the history of your city, of our city, because I was born in this city on Hercules Street, a little two street on the southwest side of this city on December 14th, 1930. It's been a long time ago. But it is still home and it's always good to be back. To the other officials and to you ladies and gentlemen, we're very happy that you have come here to join in this celebration for Claudette. It's good to have uh, my wife Carol with me and as Councilman mentioned about Wilkie Gunn, who is also a plaintiff of mine, is our special guest here today too. He desegregated what is now the University of North Alabama 
He will be receiving an honor at the NAACP Gala this afternoon. Two weeks from now, he will uh, last May, uh, he was the commencement speaker at his alma mater, the University of North Alabama, and received an honorary doctorate degree. And two weeks from now, he will be back up in his home area, and they will be naming one of the largest buildings on the campus of the University of North Alabama after Will Kid Gunn. I'm happy to have him as my special guest here today, Samuel Griffith. When your councilman, Councilman Larkin, contacted me and asked me about coming, and I told him I'd be happy to come, he said in his letter of invitation, and I want to share it with you because it kind of sets the stage for what I'm supposed to do, whether I do it or not. This is what he said. I would request that you offer remarks recounting your rich experience associated with the bus boycott, the movement in general, and certainly your recollection of the series of events related to Claudette's defense culminating in the role she played in the successful litigation that led to the desegregation order from the United States Supreme Court. Now, that's what he told me to do. <laughs> that's a big order. I don't think I could do justice to everything he has told me in the time he allotted me to do it, and I won't even tell you what time that was. <laughs> but I'm going to try. And then you be the judge when I finish. 63 years ago today, Claudette Carvin was arrested for refusing to give up her seat to a white person on a city bus in this city, not very far from where we are today. The day or so after her arrest, on the recommendation of Mr. E.D. Nixon, who was considered to be Mr. Civil Rights in this city and did so much for it, Claudette parents contacted me I discussed a case, agreed to represent her, and I have been a voice speaking on behalf of and telling the nation and telling around the world the story about Claudette Carvin. I didn't just start. From the day I was retained 63 years ago until this day, there is very seldom a speech that Fred Gray makes any place, and I just made a series of them in Atlanta, Georgia, this past weekend. I talk about Claudette Calvin. Let me share with you the first paragraph I wrote in my autobiography, Bus Ride to Justice. It's on page 43 of the first edition and on page 47 of the current edition. And I want to tell you, so you'll know, I haven't just started talking about Claudette. This is what I said then, initially in 95 and then again in 2013. Nine months before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, I represented Claudette Carvin for a similar act of resistance. On March 2, 1955, Claudette, a 15-year-old high school student, refused to obey a bus driver's order that she relinquish her seat. She was already at the back of the bus 
and refuse to make her seat available to a white person. When she remained seated, the bus driver called police officers who dragged her from the bus and arrested her. And you've seen a part of this uh, on the documentary that was shown. And if you want the rest of the story, Claudette has written, along with her author, her complete story about what happened to her on that dreadful day and the facts and circumstances surrounding why she did what she did and why all of the other students who were on that bus and some of them got up but I want you to know that they, she was willing to stand up then, and she has been standing up ever since. This was Claudette Carvin's introduction to the city of Montgomery's justice system, and you've seen it. Claudette Carvin case was the first civil rights case I had. I've had the privilege of, of, of representing a lot of people who are known a lot more than Claudette, but those cases were not the first one. Rosie Parks wasn't, Dr. King wasn't, Selma to Montgomery wasn't. The, 90, the 89 persons who were involved and indicted during the Montgomery bus boycott the 40,000 African Americans who participated in the Montgomery bus boycott weren't the first one. It was Claudette Carvin's case was my first civil rights case. You know, there's always something you remember about first things. Some of you know something about your first love. So I thought when Claudette was arrested, this would be the opportunity I had to fulfill the reason I became a lawyer in the first place. And the reason I decided to become a lawyer was to destroy everything segregated I could find, and I wanted to start doing that right here in the city of Montgomery, Alabama. And I believe, with a lot of help along the way, we've been able to do some of that during the past 63 years. I was prepared when Claudette's parents wanted me to represent her, and when Claudette, because of her defiant stand and her youth, and her insistence on enforcing the Constitution and making it a, a living document, I was ready to go into federal court then and file a lawsuit like I did a year later. But the community weren't quite ready. You know, sometimes we can be ready to do things, but others are not. And you have to realize you can't, this job of doing away with segregation is so difficult. And Claudette realized it was difficult and was willing even to go to jail in order to do it and to do it as a 15 year old child. Immediately after her arrest, not only did Mr. Nixon come to her rescue, but so did Joanne Robinson and other women involved in the Women's Political Council, an organization of educated women who were committed to improving conditions in all aspects of life in the black community in this city. Claudette was charged with being a delinquent. Judge Hill, the juvenile court judge of Montgomery County at the time, tried her case. I explained to him that Claudette was not a delinquent, 
that she was an honored student, that she was on her way from school, and that she did what she did because, and she wasn't seated in the reserved white section of the buses, but she did what she did because she thought she had a constitutional right to do it. And when you have that type of determination, and when you're willing to pay the price when you do the defined act, then I think you're moving in the right direction. The judge was very attentive, he was very courteous, he listened to me, and he ruled against me. That was the history of my early civil rights litigation in most of my cases, but I didn't stop. He found Claudette to be a delinquent. And for punishment, what did he do? Placed her on unsupervised probation, which meant she didn't have to report to anybody. She didn't have to do anything any different than what she had been doing before. I was ready to file the suit, but we weren't quite ready. I felt very badly about the result of Claudette's case. So did Mrs. Joanne Robinson, who had had, who was a professor at Alabama State and who had had a somewhat similar experience, but on an empty bus by a mean white bus driver, and all of them were white in those days, as far back in 1949. But she had not forgotten it. And after Claudette's arrest, Joanne Robinson, now a member of the Women's Political Council, arranged a meeting for us to meet with city officials of the city of Montgomery and the bus company officials on Claudette Carvin's case. They listened to us. They said that they were sorry about what happened to Claudette and that they didn't believe it would happen again. Joanne Robinson in that meeting told the city officials of this city and the bus company officials that if conditions didn't improve, African Americans would consider staying off of the buses. Notwithstanding their promise that conditions would be better we later found out that in October of 1955, even before Mrs. Rosa Parks, Mary Louise Smith was arrested on a similar charge. And then on December 1st, 1955, as all of you know, Mrs. Parks was arrested. Even though we did not proceed at that time with Claudette case, those of us who were involved in it and those of us who were close to trying to solve the problems and who recognized the problem learned some things from Claudette's case. And all of what I'm telling you here is set out in Bus Ride to Justice and it gives you some details behind the scene activities of the legal aspect, not only of Claudette's case and Mrs. Park's case and the Montgomery Bus Boycott case, but the whole civil rights movement from the time it started here in Montgomery in 55 up until relatively recently. But what we learned and when I say we, I'm particularly thinking about Joanne Robinson, E.D. Nixon, Rosa Parks, Fred Gray, and others. We learned that there were a lot of people in this city who wanted to do something about the buses. And what we decided to do is that we would be prepared so that whenever the opportunity presented itself with whoever was involved, we would be ready to take whatever action that needed to be taken. 
for a year from the time I started practicing law until December 1st, 1955. Mrs. Parks would come to my office. We would share our lunch and we would talk together. And we had that discussion on that day. So she knew what to do if anything happened. And we made the plans. And she went back home. She went back to her job. I went out of town. She knew I was not going to be in. The opportunity presented itself. Mrs. Parks was arrested. When I got back, I had calls from Mrs. Parks. She invited me to come over to her house after she was out of jail and she retained me to represent her. I told her, don't represent, don't worry about her case. It was set for the following Monday. This is on Thursday evening. I left her house and went to E.D. Nixon's house and talked to him because he had already gotten out of jail and had, uh, had already also uh, gotten, uh, had told me and I knew what his position was on it. Then I went and talked to Joanne Robinson, and we sat in Joanne Robinson's house on the evening of December 1st and December 2nd and made the plans for the Montgomery bus boycott. Time will not permit me here today to tell you, but we set out in detail in Bus Ride to Justice what we did, getting the preachers involved, why Dr. King was selected, giving key positions to Mr. Nixon and Mr. Lewis, selecting Fred Gray to be the lawyer for the spokesman, calling upon the community to stay off of the bus as a protest on December 5th, setting a meeting for, uh, at the evening of December 5th at Holt Street Baptist Church. And when Dr. King spoke, we knew that the plans we made in Joanne Robinson's house that evening were the right plans, and the rest of it is history. So then, from that day, as I have indicated to you, till this day, I have been talking about Claudette. I'm going to mention only one other incident, and then I'm going to sit down, and I think I will have talked about Claudette and her experiences. I will have said something about the Montgomery bus boycott. <laughs> and we'll see where we are. In February of 1972, I was invited to Long Island, New York to do a series of Black History Month speeches. I contacted Claudette, who was living in the Bronx, and invited her to join me at some of those meetings on Long Island. She came, I introduced her, and she was received warmly by people on Long Island in 1972. That was right before we got started on the Tuskegee Sisley study. For over 40 years, I was almost the only voice really speaking on a national scene about Claudette. Most people didn't even know about her. And as I travel across the country, even today, there are still a lot of people who do not know about Claudette Carvin and don't know about the role she played. Today, after 63 years, I am happy that my hometown and her hometown, the city of Montgomery, the cradle of the Confederacy, the home of the Civil Rights Movement, have elected to honor Claudette. And we are delighted that you are here. So give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Let me close by telling you how important I think Claudette's events and what she did and why it is important to the civil rights movement. Again, 
If you go to bus ride to justice, you'll have it there. And this is what I wrote. I think this points up what, what Claudette did on March 2nd, 1955. I think I, I, I tried to capture it so that the nation would know what I thought, how important what she did was to the movement. And this is what I said, and I'm through. One could say that Mrs. Park's refusal to surrender her seat on a Montgomery bus was a pebble cast in the segregated waters of Montgomery, Alabama that created a human rights tidal wave that eventually washed upon the shores of such faraway places as the Bahamas, China, South Africa, the Soviet Union, Egypt, and the Middle East. However, and this is the important part, if Claudette Carvin had not done what she did on March 2nd, 1955, Mrs. Parks may never have done what she did on December 1st, 1955. <laughs> if Mrs. Parks had not done what she, if Mrs. Parks had, had given up her seat on December 5th, 1955, she would never have been arrested there will never have, she would never have had a trial on December 5th, 1955. There would have been no beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott at that time. No mass meeting would have occurred at Hope Street Baptist Church. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would not have been introduced to the city, the state, the nation, nor the world on December 5th, 1955. The holes history of the civil rights movement may have been different, but for what Claudette Carlin did. <laughs> Finally, you can see, not only did Claudette Carlin inspire us and inspire the other 40,000 African Americans to begin the Montgomery bus boycott, but what she did and what other persons involved in the Montgomery bus boycott did and what happened in the civil rights movement since that time all combined to the election and re-election of Barack Obama as the 44th president of the United States of America. Claudia Carving paved the way for it, and it all started on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Thank you very much. Hello to my King Hill family. It gives me great pleasure to be in greetings and to say my heartfelt thanks to all of you for your overwhelming support. I wish I could be there with you honoring me in this way during Black History Month and on the anniversary of my arrest some 60 plus years ago. Before women who was plaintiff of Browder versus Gale, the U.S. Supreme Court case may not have gotten the recognition we deserve. But I do know one thing. 
Aurelia Browder, Susan McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, Claudette Carvin will forever be remembered in the heart of the people of Montgomery and my King Hill family. You all are such an inspiration to me and you give me hope that our history will never be forgotten. I want to thank Councilman Larkin and all who play a role in putting this program together. May God continue to keep you in his favor and thank you for honoring me.
Aleluya. We would like to give Ms. Dr. Dorothy Riggins another hand for that solo, as well as Councilman Larkins and Attorney Fred Gray. This event has been amazing for our civil rights history. I thank you guys for all coming out. We're now going to have some words of inspiration from Dr. Felicia Bell of the Troy State Rosa Parks Museum, followed by Reverend Joseph Rampert and our Mayor Todd Strange. Good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be here and thank you to uh, the mayor and to Councilman Larkin for inviting me to be here uh, on this glorious day today. Um, it's such an honor to celebrate Claudette Colvin and her courageous act of protest on March 2nd, 1955. And this morning, uh, as I was preparing my remarks, I thought of my dear friend, Dr. Kate Maser, she's a professor of history at Northwestern University, and her book, and it's entitled, An Example for All the Land, Emancipation and the Struggle Over Equality in Washington, D.C. And in this book, the reader is introduced to Kate Brown, who was a black woman who boarded a train in Alexandria, Virginia, headed to Washington, D.C. in 1868. After Kate Brown boarded the ladies' car of the train at the Alexandria Depot, a policeman asked her to leave the ladies' car, and she refused. She later testified, I told him I came down in that car, and in that car I intended to return. He said I could not go. I asked him why. He said that car was for ladies. I told him then that was the very car I wanted to go in. The policeman grabbed Miss Brown and tried to pull her from the car, but she held on to the door and braced her foot against the seat. After the policeman threatened to beat her, she told him he could go ahead. I had made up my mind not to leave the car unless they brought me off dead. The policeman pounded Miss Brown's knuckles, twisted her arms, and grabbed her collar. He was soon joined by a man who called himself a sheriff, who held her by the neck and helped drag her out of the car and onto the platform. All of this lasted about 11 minutes while people on the platform watched. She later testified, I declare, they could not have treated a dog worse than they treated me. It was nothing but damn nigger and cursing and swearing all the time. Kate Brown's arrest happened 28 years before Plessy versus Ferguson, the landmark decision of the US Supreme Court to uphold the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities and 87 years before Claudette Colvin's arrest, and 144 years before Trayvon Martin's murder. African Americans continue to struggle to navigate public spaces freely, a basic civil right. This is why it is so important for us to hold our elected officials and public servants accountable. But that is predicated upon your vote. So as we honor this brave woman today, think about how you can make a difference in securing civil rights for everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon. I didn't think that I was going to have to say anything, but you all know preachers, we just can't resist it when somebody offers us an opportunity. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, say thank you to all of the people in the King Hill community. 
uh, Tracy Larkin. Uh, I have to first of all thank my city councilman, uh, Mr. Charles Genwright. You know, when I first came up with this idea of trying to honor her, he was the first one that I talked to. And I had people say, it's no need of going to uh, Charles Genwright. Those folk aren't going to do anything to honor us. And it made me think about 1975 when I studied about Richard Allen, the founder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. I said, he needs to be honored. So I said, I'm gonna get Governor Wallace to issue a proclamation. He's born on Valentine's Day, but we're gonna call it Richard Allen's Day. And everybody told me, man, you must be crazy. They're not gonna honor Richard Allen, but George Wallace issued a proclamation, being Methodist himself. He issued a proclamation for Richard Allen Day in the state of Alabama. So I've, I've learned over the years that you don't ever say what can't be done until you, until you try. I want to thank uh, particularly Cassandra uh, Sanders for, you all ought to give her a big applause for putting this thing together. This is the, this is the first time I have met her personally, even though we became Facebook friends a couple of months ago and she was interested in us doing something again this year. Uh, I want to thank the mayor and the city council for starting this on last year. And the community said that they want to keep it going. And I told her, look, I'm 70 years old. I did it one time, now I want to step out of the way. You handle it. And she has done a marvelous job working with uh, Councilman Larkin and everybody else who's played a role in this thing. I want to say to you that I am so honored to be in the presence, as always, of uh, Attorney Fred Gray. He may not even remember it. Uh, when I passed the St. Paul AME Church, when, where she was a member until she left uh, Montgomery, when she came back, I think it was around 2000, they wanted to go to Tuskegee, Alabama, where her mother's buried over there. And when we got the money to go, several ministers wanted to donate to that. Attorney Fred Gray met us and took us through the uh, museum over there and gave us a wonderful history. And I want you to know that he is the real deal. I always talk about fake folk. Uh, that's, what the, that's what the kids used to say when I taught school uh, over in Selma, Alabama, every time I'd break up a fight. I would ask them, why are you fighting? He called me fake, she called me fake. And if somebody calls you fake, you have to represent. So I, you know, I thought about that and one day I did, a, I did one of my sermons in rap form. That's why I didn't get beat up by the kids at school <laughs> because that's what, I, they used to call me the rapping Reverend Rembert. And, and I found out that I didn't need the police to protect me because the kids liked that. And so I said, I'm gonna try one of my sermons in rap and, and the name of it is Fake Folk. And, and it says, I'm writing this line because here's the deal. You may disagree, but this is how I feel. I meet few people who are really real. It gives me a chill, it takes away the thrill out of my life. The music of my fife is rife with discords and inharmonious jangles as I try to comprehend the next man's angles. Like those who by daylight are pure and right, but are brothers with Satan at the coming of night. Saying one thing, then doing another, disappointing that mother, putting down each other, willing to smother the life out of anybody who rejects their druthers. They're in the parking lot before the church is opening, hoping, scoping out weaklings for their interlopings. Like actors on a stage, they seek world applause without giving pause to discover a cause for their pitiful existence. Don't you dare laugh, it's never a joke when I'm provoked to talk to you about fake folk. Folk who all of that on a bag of chips if you believe what they say with their lying lips. But Jesus was wise and saw through their lies and fake disguise and spoke harsh words to their surprise. Yeah, you did prophesy, did miracles in my name. But you weren't real with that, you just played the game. So don't be surprised when on that day as I turn you away, you will hear me say, I don't even know you. That's the price you pay for being fake folk. So if you're faking it, you ain't making it, you better get real because God ain't taking it. Think about your soul and stop forsaking it. This message that I give is to provoke all of us to stand like the mighty oak and resist the temptation of living as fake folk. That was my, that was my whole sermon and everybody says he's gonna preach. And I am, I am so glad 
even though I wasn't born and raised here in Montgomery, uh, don't even pastor here anymore, I have met some of the most far real people uh, since I've been here that I could, that I could ever meet. And uh, Attorney Fred Gray is just one of those people. Uh, when, I, when I taught school, let me say this, because I know this is about Claudette Colvin and Rosa Parks, but our history, is this, uh, is this uh, uh, Women's History Month or something? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's that. But it made me think out of all of the, out of all of the years of our history, somebody said that history is a story of something that never happened written by somebody who wasn't there. But I'm so glad to meet people who were there uh, for this history. And when I think about all of the women in history, we talked about Calvin, we talked about Parks, but then just about six days before, Rosa Parks sat on the bus. There's a lady by the name of Sarah Keyes who had just won her case with the Interstate uh, Commerce Commission. Uh, it had been announced anyway that she had won a desegregation lawsuit in Carolina. And even before her in 1940, in 1944, a woman by the name of uh, 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 Irene Morgan, she got married, her name was Kirkady, and she was on her way from Virginia back to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and she was arrested on similar cases. Everybody says that uh, Claudette Calvin was, you know, she was mean and she fought. Well, so did these women. Uh, uh, Sarah Keyes was a whack, and when they tried to move her, she fought back. She had to be arrested. Irene Morgan, they sent for a sheriff, and she kicked him where it really hurt. Now, I don't have to tell you all about that. She kicked him where it really hurt. And all of these women stood up. Brown versus Board of Education. It was named after Oliver Brown, a man, but I'm so proud of the nine women that were also plaintiffs in that case. And what I'm saying to you is, is that the history in this country of uh, beautiful women, they've stood up for so many years. Uh, everything that I can think of, you think I'm smart, I'm not smart, but when I taught seventh grade social studies, one of the things that I told my students during Black History Month, I want you to do a paper, but I don't want that paper to be just on the us four and no more that everybody knows about. And so they researched and they found all of these people. And what I'm saying to you is as we talk to our young people, tell them to search and they will find so many beautiful women, black and white, I'll tell you that have made great contributions to our society and keep on making great contributions to our society. And I, I thank God that he has given me an opportunity to walk with giants in this city, in this state, that have made contributions to better humanity. And, and I, I would say to you, when I talk, I hear all of the brutality. I, I, used, to, I used to speak all of the I used to speak all of the poems. I used to love uh, uh, poems about freedom. Black uh, Christmas addicts taught us how to die before white Patrick Henry, Henry's bugle breath uttered the vertical transmitting cry. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go on with that, but all of those things I knew. But then one day I heard a poem, at least I read a poem that said, you have to be taught to hate and fear. You have to be taught from year to year. It has to be drummed in your dear little ear. You have to be carefully taught. You have to be taught to be afraid of people whose skin is a different shade, of people whose eyes are oddly made. You have to be carefully taught. You have to be taught before it's too late, before you're six or seven or eight, to hate all the people that your parents hate. You have to be carefully taught. And what it's saying, and what Dr. King told, is, told us, is that darkness cannot cast out darkness. Only light can do that, and the light of love is what we need in this country. There are two young ladies that came here with me. Where, where are you? Stand up. They, they, are from, they are from Nigeria. Last year I had students from India, uh, Africa, all over the country. They've all heard of Rosa Parks, but not one of them had heard anything about Claudette Colvin. And when I was telling them the stories, I tell all of the students over there at Troy about uh, Claudette Colvin. And I have uh, uh, Fred Gray's book. I've been reading it. I'm, I think I'm undiagnosed ADD, so I read it a little bit at a time. But I have read that book. It's a wonderful book. You ought to get it. If you don't have it, get it and read it. It's, it has so much rich, rich history. And I'm so glad that these young folk can go back to Nigeria and they can tell their uh, 
friends and everybody else about somebody else they knew about who made great strides for freedom in America. Thank you all so very much for everything. I hear in some of the churches I go to, as I prepare to close, I wanted Tracy Larkin to join me today because he has been the person that has kept the light lit, and as a matter of fact, even lit the light so that we could honor Claudette Colvin. We've done that uh, on previous occasions, and we're delighted to do it uh, again today. It is not lost on me that we are here 63 years after Claudette and after Rosa Parks because while Claudette was a juvenile, she was adjudicated in a juvenile court, not in this facility, but Rosa Parks because she was arrested as a uh, municipal offense. She was in fact adjudicated about 100 feet from where you sit today, but yet today, we welcome you with open arms, without any handcuffs, and without any court there. We're here in the court of public opinion because I am so uh, impressed uh, to have seen uh, that movie, the uh, documentary. It was gut-wrenching for me. But there were three scenes in there that I will take away from here. As George Patton said to the German general, I read Fred Gray's book, so I know what's in there. And so I knew a bit about that. The first scene obviously was the arrest of Claudette. The second was the arrest of Rosa Parks. But tears came to my eyes at the last scene when she was getting on the bus and the very bus driver that had arrested her reached out the hand of reconciliation. And that's what we've been trying to do in Montgomery, Alabama, is reach out that hand of reconciliation. And we had the privilege on Martin Luther King Day at Dexter King Church to do a speech similar to Dr. King's, the How Long speech. We're in Montgomery, Alabama. We're where Dr. King had his only pastorate but yet we have no statue of Dr. Martin Luther King. And so I asked the question, how long? But hopefully we answered it by saying not long. Right. Not long because in our presence today is the artist that has been selected and he has done work over the last few months. As a matter of fact, he has a meeting today Ronald McDowell from Tuskegee is here. Would you stand and be recognized? And Ronald, whether we get it in August or December, it's going to be in 2018. Not long, not long, not long. We have already identified an individual that Dr. Gray, Dr. Gray, Dr. Fred Gray uh, represented. I did not know him, met him about an hour and a half ago, but we found out that our paths were within about five years of crossing because in my early days, I was with Bell Telephone and I was moved to the Tri-Cities area as the area manager there about five years before he integrated the then Florence State uh, University. And so we have a thing or two. Uh, if you would, uh, Mr. Gunn, join us here. know you really well, we only have five whereases. If we'd have known you longer, we might have had more whereases. And I'm not going to read all of the whereases, but Tracy Larkin told me about this. Whereas Wendell Wilkie Gunn became the first African-American student to enroll and graduate from Florence State University, now the University of Alabama. He enrolled in September 63, graduated in 65 bachelor's degree in mathematics and chemistry. You've already heard that he worked in the Reagan White House uh, during that period of time. 
vice president of Chase Manhattan Bank, former director of investor relations with PepsiCo and assistant professor at Texas Southern University. 82, uh, Mr. Gunn was appointed by President Reagan as assistant director for commerce and trade. I told him that we have a lot of international trade in Montgomery, Alabama, not only with our Koreans, but our Japanese and our Germans. Uh, we have a lot of those. Window is to be applauded for his many accomplishments and the bravery and resolve shown as a young man who broke the color barrier with grace as well as courage. We want to today, March 2nd, in addition to Claudette Colvin, we want to name it the Wendell Wiki Gun Day in Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> And because this is the weekend of the, the bridge crossing, we also have one of the mementos that we did for the, the 50th bridge crossing celebration that we had uh, uh, two years, three years ago now, I guess. We give you that. And then I have a little personal memento, which happens to be the mayor's coin. I knew nothing about this. <laughs> If I had, I would have objected. <laughs> Do you have a word? Oh. Just a word. Just a word. <laughs> it all started with Claudette Colvin. <laughs> yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> photo op, photo op, okay. We have one more, one more thing. The other thing that we have, well, as, as Fred Gray crumbs, let me, let me share with you what we wanted to say. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do that. But let me say this about uh, Fred Gray. You already heard that um, we rode around the state going to Leadership Alabama classes because we were in that class together. That was in my rich days when I was in the car business. So we'd always take the most luxury car that we had on the lot to make that trip. But that was 20 years ago, and I heard firsthand the stories that we're now hearing and that now we're, we're now celebrating. And as I was preparing to make a word or two about you, Fred, I too looked at not only your book, but I read the article in Newsweek. And I'm going to claim credit to say great minds work together because he referenced in his remarks what I am referencing today. While her role to fight to end segregation in Montgomery may not be widely recognized, Colvin helped advance civil rights efforts in the city. Claudette gave all of us moral courage. If she had not done what she did, I am not sure that we would have been able to mount the support for Miss Parks, said Fred Gray. And I will even add to that, Tracy, and I hope you will agree with me as a city council person, because we've got great momentum. And that great momentum comes in large part because of our efforts in the travel industry, the tourism industry. Every night in Montgomery, Alabama, $1.4 million is, sent, is spent. Civil rights is at the heart. He said human rights is at the heart of what's happening in Montgomery, Alabama. And it started with Claudette Coffin. It was carried on by Rosa Parks. And today we are reaping the benefits economically and financially for the courage that those two ladies had at 63 years ago. We are indebted forever to them and their, their memory. So thank you for being here today. You wanted the picture, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You want to close it down? It's a little bit over there. It's a little thing. I'll go in there. Oh, it's just okay. Thank you. This is terrible. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our tribute to Colette Colvin. I hope you guys enjoyed yourselves, and we look forward to the next one. Thank you, and have a great day.